All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that little clip as a reminder that, you know, associative activation errors can happen um, even in the most uncomfortable situations. Loss of activation error refers to forgetting an intention to do something or remember the intention for forgetting what to do. Um, so with a loss of activation, you have an intention. Um, maybe you're going to go get something or you're going to um, buy something or call someone or whatever. And you go into the room where you're going to get the thing or you get online to go find the thing that you're going to buy or whatever it is. And you're like, why am I here? <laughs> like I got up, I came into this other room and I can't remember why I'm here. Or I booted up my computer and I was going to go do something and I can't remember what I was going to do. My personal new favorite type of loss of activation error is um, to pick up my phone because I'm going to text somebody. And then I see that there's a notification on my phone. So I follow the notification and then I get absorbed in whatever that was about. And then I forget why I picked up my phone in the first place. <laughs> it's like, <sighs> sometimes the act of putting the phone back down and going back to what I was doing that had prompted me to think to text the person in the first place will cause me to remember that I was going to text somebody. Um, but it's hit or miss. A lot of times I put the phone down and I literally, there's nothing I can do to get it to come back. I cannot remember why I picked that phone up. Um, very annoying. But, you know, and I think that's the problem with notifications because that little flashing light tells you, that, no, there's something more important you need to be doing. And it triggers that loss of activation because now I went off and I, I started thinking something else. And that's what um, the loss of activation is. I had something uh, in my mind and I was going to follow through with this thing that I had in my mind. I'm doing all the actions that would allow me to to follow through with what I had had in my mind. But by the time I start to do it, it's out of my mind. I can't remember it. Now, this obviously is Bill Cosby. And so you may be offended that it's here and, and things. But back in 1987, before no, anybody knew anything bad, um, he had a really great bit on not only this loss of activation error where, you know, he goes in another room to get something, but he has a really funny explanation for where it goes. And so if you want to not have to watch too much of what he's talking about, you can just hop right to, to three minutes into the, into the piece and you'll see um, where he says it goes. <laughs> um, or you can skip the whole thing. You don't have to watch it, but I'll put it in the playlist and um, you can do with it what you want. All right. So um, the last kind of problem with automaticity is a description error where um, the desired action is in fact carried out, but you do it with the wrong object. So um, that could be, for example, this cartoon where she's so engaged in watching her soap operas that she's accidentally ironing the cat instead of ironing the clothes. That's a pretty dramatic description error, but um, you can imagine where, um, you know, you're your attention is pulled. And so instead of grabbing the spatula to flip over the pancakes, you grabbed the, um, you know, the big spoon or something like that. Um, so you're trying to carry it out. You haven't forgotten what you're doing. You just sort of absentmindedly because of this automaticity, you absentmindedly, um, tried to use the wrong object. I guess my peanut butter and jelly example that I had used earlier um, would be a, a good example of that also, where you're um, carrying out the desired action of putting away the objects, but you're doing it with each the wrong object, right? So you're refrigerating something that doesn't need to be and not refrigerating something that does kind of thing. So um, some of these can kind of be mixed examples, right? Like none of these are pure. You can be doing a, a, a data-driven error that's also um, an example of, you know, a description error. So they, they can be combined, um, but it's a pretty good list of why maybe we shouldn't all wish that everything was just automatic because we'd be making mistakes all the time, right? We'd be having a lot of these errors. All right. Well, we've gotten through the, the filter models, um, which really heavily emphasize the characteristics of the stimulus as determining what you're going to pay attention to. But more modern cognitive psychologists really want to talk about goal-driven goal 
attention where, you know, you're paying attention because of something inside of yourself. You know, you have an interest or a motivation that's that's causing your attention to be applied. Um, it's a type of top down processing, which I had defined in, in chapter one. But um, this is the type of processing where um, things that are already inside your head, things that you already know, things that you already believe, um, motivations and, and those kinds of things that drives your attention. So you're going to be assigning your attention based on previous knowledge, your expectations, your current goals, those kinds of things. So you're doing it um, willfully instead of just having your attention pulled. So if uh, we were searching through this field of um, circles looking for the one that's different, it, this one with the plus sign would hop out pretty easily, right? We've All we've added is a plus sign and it's going to jump out really easily. Um, it turns out it's easier to find an item that has something added to it than it is to find an item that is missing something. So the task of finding the one plus sign circle on the left panel is easier than the task of finding the circle that's missing the plus sign that's on the right side. Um, so there are some characteristics of the stimuli that's still going to matter, even if you're, you know, going to get paid for finding the stimulus. And so you're really motivated or something um, and you know what you're looking for, the previous knowledge and the expectations are all there. Um, it's still there are certain characteristics of the stimulus that's going to make some tasks a little easier than other. Um, the, the one on the left is considered an easier task. And, and the way we know it's easier is that people do it faster. Right. Reaction time is the measure of ease. Um, the one on the left is actually done as more of a pre attentive process because it's going to be one of those things that pulls your attention. Whereas the one on the right is going to be a harder, AKA slower task. Um, it'll take you a little bit longer because you're actually having to apply attention. You're actually going to have to be looking at them and looking for the one that's missing the, the, um, the plus sign. Um, it works the same way with color, by the way, um, finding the, one on the left that has the addition of yellow to the color red, thus making orange. That's an easier task because you've added something to it. The task on the right is harder because we've subtracted yellow from one of them and that's resulted in red. Now on my screen, I gotta tell you, <laughs> the red one sticks out way more than the orange. So if you're having that experience also, um, you know, I think that's a function of the screen. I don't think my colors are coming out correctly. When it projects in the classroom, you can see that the um, that it's way easier to do the one on the, on the left. But on my screen, it's not corresponding. Um, that's fun to find that while I'm in the middle of a lecture, but okay. Um, so searching for targets, which is basically what we were just illustrating with those panels, right? You're looking for the one that has the plus sign. You're looking for the one that is orange, something like that. Um, with a, with low target prevalence, um, we are searching for things that rarely occur. So, um, we get a faster reaction time when the target is present than when it's absent. So if you're looking for something that you hardly ever see, we find that you, you do respond more quickly when it does show up. It takes you longer to confirm that it's absent. You really have to look to confirm that it's absent. So for example, if you're a um, screener at the airport and your job is to look for a gun in a, um, in, in check in, what is this carried on baggage? Um, you have to really look um, when it's there, super obvious. When it's not there, you really have to examine the objects and s make sure that you're not missing it, right? So it takes longer to confirm the absence of something than it does to confirm the presence of something. Uh, and they've noticed this with low target prevalence um, situations where you don't see it that often. So that means you really have to search because you don't want to miss that one in a hundred or one in a thousand times that it happens. When there's high target prevalence, what we're talking about is there's multiple targets present. Um, and so a lot of times as you're searching for another instance of the target, because there's many of them present, you may experience what's called an attentional blink which is where once you've found one target, you have difficulty seeing the next one. Like you can't perceive that quickly. Oh, I found one. Now I need to change my attention and acknowledge that I found another one. There's that blink where you're like, I found it, I found it. You know, sort of this um, celebratory moment where you cannot shift to, to searching again. 
So one of the best things that you can do in a high target prevalence situation is have multiple searchers so that one who has found it can be over here thinking I found it and missing the next one as hopefully the next searcher sees it, right? So you wanna have multiple searchers in these situations. Um, so for example, uh, my husband used to be in the Coast Guard and this is an actual picture um, where they would sit on the back of the open C-130 airplane looking for, and they'd have people looking out the windows also, but they wanted to get 360 degree eyes on the, on the sea looking for the people whose boat sank or whatever. And a lot of times there are, uh, there are de debris fields when a boat has gone down. And so they see life jackets and they see, um, you know, ice chests and other things that can float. And so as you're seeing the ice chest, if you're experiencing an attentional blink, you might miss the person in a life jacket that's floating nearby, right? Because you're busy picking up all the debris. So having lots of people look um, and reporting, oh, ice chest, oh, life jacket, oh, oh, person, right? So that hopefully you have multiple people looking and, and we can dismiss some of the objects and, and see the ones that are really the important ones. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about really is how to prioritize attention, right? Like how can we maximize um, noticing things that we want to notice and maybe ignoring things that we don't want to see. Um, let's talk a little bit about the kinds of stimuli that attract our attention. And then maybe that gives us a little bit of more power as we think about, okay, I know this probably attracted my attention. Maybe I should deliberately shift my attention to something else. Like for example, negative expressions tend to attract our attention. So when we look at this picture, the easiest, fastest one to notice is the person in the lower right-hand corner that looks angry. Um, this attracts our attention. And so even though the vast majority of people that we're encountering in this scenario are neutral, right? They're not happy, they're not sad, they're just neutral. Um, the one person with the mad face catches our attention. And that can cause us to then think, I had a bad experience today because, you know, I, oh, there's my Audubon clock. I experienced an angry person and we may even overblow it in our minds and think we experienced a lot of negativity when in fact we may, we encountered, you know, one ninth of our encounters was negative. Um, so knowing that negative expressions attract our attention gives us a little bit of power to say, okay, but don't let it be the most important thing that you experienced today. It's just something that you experienced today. Um, here's another example where we've got a bunch of neutral faces and we've got this person on the middle left who is, um, that's really just a sign of submission that they're displaying. Um, again, that's kind of not a positive expression, right? But it's attracting our attention, even though there's a little smile there. All right, now these two concepts, I have a couple of videos I'm gonna set up in the playlist for you to watch that'll illustrate these concepts of change blindness um, and inattentional blindness. So there, um, first this one will run and then this one will run and then we'll come back and we'll talk about that, about why are we blind in these situations. So I will see you on the other side.